terms of Jesus' life, uh, Joseph was instrumental in being a stepdad, for lack of a, a better term. Right? Um, and if you read the account, I think he, he used the account from Matthew, right? On the back of your... Yes. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. Um, uh, Mitch, would you read that for us? Would you read it's that? Honor. Thank you. Go ahead. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Okay. Amen. So the first question that I want to raise with you is, what, how would you define biblical faith? Obviously, jo Joseph is a man of faith here, right? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about his character, but how would you define biblical faith? Second Corinthians 5, 7. Which is? Walk by faith, not by sight. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask it again. Would it, give me a definition of biblical faith. I, I believe in that, that I, wa I would have to. It's not easy, but I would have to walk by what I, what I see I cannot believe and trust in. Okay. You're dancing around it. I'm trying to get you more specific. You're good. right. Good. Okay. No, I need help. I'm, I'm trying to get you more That's specific. That's why you're the pastor and I'm sitting here. No, no, no. <laughs> we, we all have the same struggle. Um, there's a cultural difference uh, that uh, preachers have to build a bridge. Um, faith, when, when the, uh, the ancient Hebrew heard the word, word faith, they hear it much differently than we hear it today. All right? Uh, if you, if you go out on the street and you ask somebody if they have faith in God, m most times they'll say yes, which just means they believe there's a God. All right? Faith is not a noun. Faith is a verb. Which means that uh, biblical faith means taking God at his word. Does that make sense? Yes. And obeying it. That's what Joseph did here, didn't he? Which right? is not easy. Well, no. I mean, consider this. He's, uh, you know, he's betrothed to Mary. Uh, and again, we have a cultural difference here. Uh, engagements were for a year in, in the Jewish culture, all right? And it, it, it's binding. In other words, uh, the only thing that can break that bond is a writ of divorce, even though they're not married yet, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, um, the other uh, um, rule, if I could say, is that they have no sexual relationship until, the, you know, the marriage. So, uh, Joseph and Mary, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming the marriage was prearranged and ordained by God, all right? Because that was the, the normal, you know, in, in that uh, culture. Um, so Joseph is portrayed here as a devout man, correct? How do I know that? He, he says, um, her husband Joseph, faithful to the law, he knew the word, 
He knew all the, the do's and don'ts, right? Yet he did not want to expose uh, Mary uh, to public disgrace, so he, he wanted to initially divorce her quietly. Right? What, what else could he have done according to the, the Jewish law? Stone her. Yeah. Yeah, right? Um, so you start to see Joseph's character here. Uh, he wants to be merciful, correct? He wants to, he obviously was in love with her, right? And he wants, he wants to honor God. And yet, uh, you know, how do you tell your uh, husband-to-be you're pregnant and, you know, try to explain that away? Uh, well, I had a visitation from God. Okay, Joseph at this point would uh, probably say, yeah, sure you did, right? Okay. Well, it's back in that culture, back yeah. in those times, it was nothing like today where there are guys walking with girlfriends and they might be pregnant with somebody else's uh, baby. And you know, nobody's actually going to stone her, that's first of all. Uh, the point is, he was going to definitely receive ridicule. It's a small society. It's okay. a small town, and everyone's going to know. So he either he either, he either slept with her before marriage, or she slept with someone else. Right. Like uh, he's done. Yeah. There, there, there's an old story. Well, it's actually a saying. Nobody ever believes the truth about a black eye. Right? You get a black eye. Like you said. It's happened to me once. Um, about two or three o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. At the time, we had one of those old wool phones in the kitchen, right? I didn't have one beside my bed. And I, I got up to answer it, and unbeknownst to me, the bedroom door was like halfway open. I ran right into the edge of the door and got a black eye. So, um, you know, over the next couple of days, uh, people were saying, okay, what did you do to Mary Lou? You know, the, you know, she gave you a black eye. No, she didn't. I ran into a door, you know. Nobody ever yeah, believes sure. that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, same thing here. This was, this was culturally uh, taboo, all right? You get pregnant out of, uh, not by your betrothed person or, it's going to be a problem, just as you said. People are going to gossip. People are going to talk. He gets a visit from Gabriel, right? Okay. And uh, let's look. That's the second paragraph here. It says, but after he had considered divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord uh, appeared to him and said, "Joseph, son of David, what is what the word? What are the words that follow?" Do not be afraid. What was the words that God used in the calling of Jeremiah? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And Mary, when he came to see Mary. Do not be afraid, right? We, we can't skip over that, all right? <clears throat> Listen, many times to... Um, biblical f faith should always affect <coughs> our, the way we live, right? And what the angel is preparing <laughs> Joseph for is simply, listen, this is going to be tough, <laughs> but don't be afraid. Do the right thing. This is of God. Your wife is going to be the one who's carrying the Savior of the world. Do the right thing. And, yeah, I don't know what Joseph faced. We don't, the Bible's silent on it, but I'm sure he faced a lot of ridicule. I'm sure he faced a lot of... Uh, uh, people saying, yeah, sure, you know, good story. Um, but, you know, he explains that she's conceived um, from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. All right? A little bit of prophecy here, correct? All right? And you will give him the name Jesus. What's important about the name Jesus? It means Savior. It means Savior. Simple as that. Yesu in the Greek, right? Yeah. Savior. He will be the Savior because he will save his people from their sins. 
Um, Joseph must have had some good teaching in the Old Testament, particularly in uh, the book of Daniel, uh, the, the book of Isaiah, and some of the other prophets, because everything pointed to the Savior, right? Uh, I'm not sure if Joseph knew at this point this wasn't going to be the militant Savior. This was going to be the suffering uh, Savior. Now, we don't know, we don't know how Joseph died, correct? Right. All right. But we know Mary lived to see her son die. Um, and I can't even, I can't even imagine the pain of that. Uh, knowing that he was unjustly accused, unjustly convicted, and to watch her son die uh, on the cross. That's a great faith also, to, to witness that. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Where's that from? Anybody? Isaiah. Isaiah, right? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. I think that's the key. Yeah. Do you? Absolutely. Right? He, I mean, he, he just he got up. And he said, God's sovereign, this is his will. I'm going to do it no matter what the consequences. Right. And then he says, you know, he, um, the Lord commanded him to take Mary home as his wife, but they did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to his son, and she gave him the name Jesus. So what... What other characteristics uh, do you see in Joseph here? And I'm going to follow that up with another question. If you were to write a dossier on Joseph, what would you include? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He's an example of someone that walked by faith instead of by sight. Okay, fair enough. I don't just know that. No, 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 I know. I've studied that. I know. I'm I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm I'm, I'm trying to hone in on this. Yes. What else? What else would you write about him? He followed the law. All right. Sharon? Faith includes action. Faith includes action. Very good. Very good. So he heard what was said to him, and he did what he was told. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't like a uh, uh, a young boy who has the chore of taking the garbage out, right? Um, I've asked you to take the garbage out. You didn't take it out. I'll do it later. It never gets done, right? I mean, I, there was none of that. This was. I had a visitation from from an angel, from Gabriel, probably, right? I need to obey. This is God, this is what God wants. I need to obey. The follow-up question to this is a little bit more complicated. How important is it for a believer to develop a biblical world view? Is it important? What, how would you define a biblical world view? How would you define that? Being able to discern and to see certain things, you know, to be able to discern what's bad, what's good, and to see things through the eyes of faith. Always filter it through that. Through those values. Okay, if I, you're absolutely right, Lou. If I could add to that, it's seeing the world through the lens of Scripture. Yeah. Amen. Okay, it's seeing the world through the lens of Scripture. It's not seeing the world through a political lens. It's not seeing the world through the cultural lens. I mean. There are people who, who will stand in line to tell you what to believe. Isn't that true? Yeah. They'll stand in line to tell you what to believe. And they're, they're, they're perfectly happy doing it. A biblical worldview is a worldview that's developed over time. And if you're not a disciple, if you're not digging into the scriptures, if you're not in, in a group study, if you're not attending church, that, that will never happen. Uh, because we catch our culture like we catch a cold. 
we don't even realize it. So many times we have a we we have a worldview that's either very cultural or it's a mix of uh, biblical principles and cultural principles. I want to suggest to you that mix is dangerous because that means that we're going to be um, double-minded, as James says, right? We're going to be tossed about like back and forth. Saw, instead of Paul. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a problem. I think it's one of the biggest problems in the American church today. And it's also a slippery slope when you, when you start to go down that path, the more you do it, the easier it gets to go all the way with it. Oh, absolutely. Pretty soon you're not looking at it biblically at all. Absolutely. Uh, it's so important to develop a biblical worldview. Folks on, on a family um, decided to devote a lot of resources to hire people to teach Christians how to, how to uh, form a biblical worldview. And that is only formed by asking hard questions, right? Um, those hard questions uh, as we really questioning the culture. Um, is what the culture is throwing <coughs> at us, so to say, biblical. If it's not, then we have to say this is wrong. Correct? Mm -hmm. Not only do we have to say it's wrong, but then we, we have to ask God through the Holy Spirit to help empower us to do what is right in, in that situation. Does that make sense? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, most churches are weak, I believe, in developing a, a biblical worldview. Uh, the other thing I would, I would encourage us to stay away from are, are platitudes. You know what platitudes are? What's a platitude? Something easy. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a saying, That's right? right? Uh, it's a saying. For instance, um, I've been, you know, I've done a lot of funerals, uh, too many, uh, and so, you know, I'll be in the funeral home, I'll be with the family, and uh, you know, people will come up to the casket and, and they'll tell the spouse, um, "Doesn't he look good?" <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm biting my tongue. <laughs> I'm saying, listen, the, the person's dead, and. If the person's a believer, you know, he or she's in a far better place. Just tell the spouse, I am so sorry for your loss, and keep your mouth closed. I was at an another one where they said, uh, you know, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Wrong thing to say. Um, that doesn't bring comfort, at, you know, at that point. We know God is sovereign, and... Uh, you know, this is part of life. You know, death is part of life. So, you know, having a biblical worldview, and I like how Lou uh, coined it before, it will give us discernment not only to evaluate situations, but also it will give us discernment into how to respond, not react, but how right. to respond. Don't respond, react. All right? Uh, don't react, respond. Respond. Yes. Uh, in a way that will glorify God. Yes. Uh, Sharon? Growing up in the, in the church as I did, it was very easy for people to just say a scripture. Yeah. And then walk away. Yeah. And even in the home, <laughs> um, yeah. it was very easy to say without understanding what the person is really dealing with. Yeah. Yes. You're absolutely right. And you didn't see that from Jesus. No. He knew what was going on. No. We, 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 we had a... Uh, uh, a godly lady in the congregation. She's with the Lord now. Um, but uh, she was going through some stuff. This going back many years. She called me and she says, will you give me some scripture? And I said, no. <laughs> and she says, what do you mean no? I said, I'd rather talk with you than give you scripture and just say, take two aspirin, call me in the morning. Right? And she she got to thinking about it, and she said, thank you. So I'll pray with you. We can talk about Scripture together if you want, but I'm not going to give you Scripture and tell you everything is going to be okay. 
Um, and the same person, uh, one time, um, I was going through a uh, difficult time, and it was Sunday morning, I generally greet the people as they come in, and she, she comes in, she says, how you doing? I said, terrible, how are you? She kept walking, right? <laughs> and then she, she did one of these things, you know, backing up. She says, you're not supposed to say that. I said, do you want me to lie to you? And she said, no. I said, well, I'm doing terrible. And she says, I'm sorry. I said, it's not your fault. I'm just being honest with you. I said, you know, thank you for giving me the freedom not to lie to you. One of the problems in the church that results in, in these platitudes and these shallow uh, sayings, trite. Trite. trite sayings, is the fact that we're, we, we, don't, we don't let people see um, Okay, we, we don't want to be honest with people. We wear mask. Vulnerabilities. Yeah. We don't want people to see we are weak. Yeah. Or human. Exactly. Right? Or human. Um, and that's not what God intended. You know, that's what he says when you, uh, you know, when somebody's crying, cry with them. Somebody laughs, laugh with them. You know? Um, e even in, in those times we admonish one another, Timing is very important in that, isn't it? Right? Um, you have to really have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, you know, in all in order to do that. Uh, otherwise, sometimes we can do more damage than uh, than good, and we have to be careful. I would commend Joseph in a, in a number of ways, and I think Pastor Fuji may have touched on this. This man right from that visitation, well, even prior to the visitation. He loved Mary. He didn't want to make a public spectacle of this, right? He, he wanted to divorce her in private. I mean, that speaks a lot of his character right there. Mercy. And, yeah, mercy. Yeah. yeah, good word. And then, after the visitation of the angel, there was no question. He was obedient, right? And, you know, 12, we know at least 12 years that he poured his own life into Jesus. What, what do you think happened during those 12 years? Yeah. I want to say something. I, I think it applies. I think yeah. it's going to the answer. If any, I, I don't mind help. Yeah. I just see something. So like in Job, right. God permitted terrible things to happen to Job. Now, the opposite in Mary and Joseph's, Joseph, I see God permitting a wonderful, he permitted their relationship to blossom, even though in the, reasonably speaking, it should have failed. Yeah, yeah, by the law. It, yes, it, but he, God, sure. had permitted it to blossom. They were the perfect parents for the God growing up. It, it, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm done. I have no more. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I, I read the call of Jeremiah, because God had all of this planned out. Joseph, you're the man. Mary, you're the woman. And to, for, for the worldly eyes to look at that, it looked terrible. Yeah. Like a fair, that's no plan. That was the plan. Can you imagine, you know, living in the town always being talked about, always say, you know, look at Mary, you know, she, she wasn't a good girl, you know, she was a good girl. And look at Joseph, you know, he, he should have divorced her, he should have got rid of her. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, a video that I use uh, in premarital counseling. Uh, I saw this on an uh, airplane on a flight to Denver, as a matter of fact, and um, it's called A Vow to Cherish. Uh, and it is, is uh, Barbara Babcock is in it, and the guy who played the White Shadow, I can't remember his name. Um, it was really well done. It was, it was done by the Billy Graham Association, which surprised me because here I am on an Eastern Airlines flight, that tells you how many years ago, uh, going uh, to Denver and they're showing this movie, and I was so struck by it. Uh, and I won't tell you the whole movie, but uh, uh, the wife, developed early Alzheimer's. 
and very progressive. And more and more, she couldn't recognize the husband, the kids, and so on and so forth. And this, the husband was a very successful businessman, and his brother was involved in his business also, and his brother kept saying, divorce her. She doesn't even know you anymore, divorce her. And he had struck, he was a runner, he struck up a relationship with a female jogger, right? Did you? Well, was Glenn Close? Was it Glenn Close? Barbara or Babcock. Was Barbara Babcock. Yeah. Okay. And um, they got emotionally close to the point where he was really considering her uh, divorcing her. And uh, his friend, who in the movie was Miles Davis, uh, brought him to a Billy Graham crusade, and Billy Graham talked about. Um, the, the word of God and obeying God and trusting God and he ran out of the meeting and he, he had to get by himself but he finally came to the point where he knew divorcing her is the wrong thing it was the convenient thing but and it was the selfish wrong. thing that's a breach of the marriage vows of course it, it is it's, it's a sickness and health yeah of course it is but we don't think like that anymore do we most weddings don't even take place in a church you know, you can get ordained online and perform a marriage ceremony, say anything you want. And we, we think, think about what has happened, right? We, we have the, I'm going to use the word uh, sacred. We, we have taken the sacredness out of marriage. We have taken the sacredness out of church. We have taken the sacredness out of um, our relationship with God. And we've cheapened it so much that we, we've taken the sacredness out of life. I don't know. The most beautiful aspect of marriage is the best friendship that exists between yeah. man and wife. Because that love, that love goes on forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's a lot to think about. This is why it's so important to develop a biblical worldview. Mm. Um, what through Billy Graham and, and the scripture that he preached on, God spoke to the husband. He didn't like it, but he had to come to terms with it, right? And he decided not to divorce her and to care for her for the rest of her life, to love her the rest of her life. Think about Hosea. We studied Hosea, right? She was a, she was a prostitute. And yet, that was God's command, marry this prostitute, to show Israel how unfaithful they've been to God in a practical way. And listen, I give kudos to Hosea. He was faithful. He lived by faith. He redeemed her off the, the slave block, right? Maybe a second time? Well, he brought it back a couple of times, but the third time she was on the slave block ready to be sold. Yeah. And he redeemed her. Yeah. Key word, right? Meaning yeah. he bought redeemed. her. He bought her. Yeah. At yeah. a price. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he loved her. As he redeemed, redeemed us. Yeah. While we were yet sinners. Yeah. Christ died for us. He redeemed yeah. us. Right? But he so, paid too much for us. But he... I mean, in a sense, he, I wasn't worth what he paid. <laughs> Well, but that's grace, right? You know, go back to the parable of the workers. Yeah, the five o'clock guy. They all got paid the same thing no matter what time they started in the fields. You know, and of course, the union got involved, right? This is not fair. This is not fair. No, I'm the master. I can do what I want. And you agree to work for this amount of money she agreed to work for this but I worked eight hours she only worked three it's none of your business I still choose to give her the full amount that's grace um, so we we have to be careful uh, Joseph in my estimation um, you know, here am I telling God what to write in the Bible, but I don't think he got enough press time, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the Bible. But I think you can take away from this, this, this man 
uh, took the role of, of not only a stepfather, but a loving stepfather, a loving husband. He taught his son a trade, right? Yeah. He taught his son a trade. He loved his son. He obviously, I don't know who, who became the teacher and the student at what point, but they obviously discussed the scriptures in the house. He was a godly man. He knew the word, right? And, you know, the older I get, the more I think about legacy, um, what we're leaving behind. And everybody th thinks about money. Well, I don't have money to leave behind, okay? But there's a more important legacy, and that legacy is what are, what are we leaving behind that's eternal? And that's an important question. Um, and it's not just for pastors, it's for anybody who calls themselves uh, a Christian, you know, and, and following. So there's a lot here in, in that passage uh, uh, about Joseph. I, give me your th final thoughts in those last few minutes. I don't yeah. want to hold you. But yeah. No, I just find it amazing. God doesn't there's a divine purpose for everything he does. There's a divine purpose for everything in the Bible. And there is a definite reason why the story of Joseph is very concise. Oh, sure. It's teaching me, God, I'm only speaking for myself. Yeah. Everybody else can jump on. Um, it's teaching me right now, in this moment, the value, besides being loud and making a great statement, <laughs> there's a value to being obedient to God, doing just what he tells you to do day in and day out and getting no public recognition <coughs> for it. There's a value. I got goosebumps. <laughs> Help me. I mean, this is what I'm getting. All right. And, and if, I, if I could add to that. Please. Because I think you're exactly right. If I can add to that, um, when people know that we are Christ followers, they're always looking. Yeah. They're always looking. And that's okay. All right? Um, and they're looking for us to fail. We, and we will all fail. But that's what confession and repentance is all about, okay? But they're looking at us. And whether we like it or not, and no matter how they react to it, when we leave our house on a Sunday carrying our Bible, something we got away from, right? Because everything's electronic now, right? That says something. That says... We're not sleeping in late. We, we're choosing to go worship God, and we value the Word of God. Um, I go, and Sharon and I talk about this a lot. I, uh, there's sometimes I, I want to turn off the multimedia in the church to get people to get their Bibles back again and you know dig into the Word. Um, uh, all of our young people use their phones. I know that. Okay, now, some of the older people. Use it or use the phones. Not that you're old, Melissa. Uh, <laughs> oh, I didn't even think of that until you said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I understand that, but there's something to be said when people see us. And I'm not talking about holier than thou. I'm talking about quietly. You're on your way to church. Your neighbors see you know uh, you're carrying a Bible. It makes a statement. You know to say I I believe this is important. You do what you want with it, but you know I believe this is important. Um, it's important uh, we're, we're not only being evaluated by unbelievers but we're being targeted by Satan because Satan wants to take us out of the game alright he wants to discourage us he wants to take us out of the game and um, listen you know by living Paul says this in Timothy right he says, live for the Lord and live it quietly. Um, that was Joseph. I'm sorry? That was Joseph. That was Joseph. That was Jesus. Right? Uh, and there's a lot to be said for that because sa Satan can't, has no defense against that. Uh, we keep, and when we have a biblical worldview, that discernment kicks in through the Holy Spirit and we continue to do what glorifies God. And the best thing we could do is glorify God, because every time we glorify God, Satan gets more angry. 
he gets more angry. Let him get angry. Because we can tell him to go back to where he came from, right? Let him get more angry. Um, so, listen, you know, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's, it's a lifestyle. And this day and age, it's not a popular message. Because we want, we want a Christianity that is convenient. And Christianity is not convenient. It's the best, it's the hardest, but it's not convenient. Um, so we have to do some soul searching at, at all of this. Um, Joseph could have taken the easy way out and nobody would have blamed him, correct? Except that he would have been disobeying God. Sometimes we choose to take the easy way out and it's not the right way. Make sense, Sharon? And in the process we lose the blessing yeah. that comes. For him it was raising the Messiah. Yeah. 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 And even you know, even for Jesus' siblings, you know, because you know, it says that um, a, a, the marriage wasn't consummated until after the birth of Christ. So Jesus' stepbrothers and sisters, um, I don't know what it's like to grow up with somebody who's perfect, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's enough problems with two imperfect people growing up together, you know, and the other siblings. Um, he had a referee all of that along with Mary, right? Uh, so what we don't see and we, what, what we don't have recorded, uh, it's going to be interesting to find out when God calls us home, all right, Joseph, how did you deal with this, you know? Or James, how did you deal with having a perfect brother? Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff going on here. Listen, if you take anything away from today, I pray that we continue to develop a biblical worldview to help us do the right thing in all circumstances. Yeah? Does this sound right, Pastor Lou? Yeah. Uh, Let's see, let me get my train of thought. Uh, if we expect perfection, how, how do I want to say this? Perfection is, yeah, here it is. Perfection is accepting imperfection. Yeah, okay. You know, because, see, the world is not perfect. Right. And if we're going to get upset over every little thing, and all that, we're done, yeah, right? We get done. paralyzed. We're done. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because when the Bible uses the word perfect, be perfect as I am perfect, right? Um, the word in the original language means mature. And complete. Well, so complete. immaturity, hopefully. <laughs> and so, again, I don't want to get off tangent here, but the implication is as a believer matures and becomes more like Christ, who you are in private is the same as who you are in public. Amen. There's no incongruity there. That's also a definition of, one definition of integrity. Yeah. Doing things when you're alone, yeah. thinking nobody sees you. Right. That you would do if you knew you were being watched. Yeah. Doing it the way you would do it if you knew you were being watched. Yeah, integrity simply means wholeness, you know, the, there we go. the, the whole thing. So, um, there's a lot here. There, there really is a lot here. And if I could add to what yeah. Mitch said, wholeness is in being able to accept the imperfections of this life. Sure. Because if, if we're accepting the imperfections, then our our frustration and our emotions become lower and we're able to tune into uh, Christ and, and the Bible. Let me, I'll put a corollary on to that. Okay. You're, you're right. Um, it also means accepting our own imperfections, okay? And uh, letting God help us to change those. That's what sanctification is, isn't it? Mm, yes. All right. Uh, because we can't change them. You know, we we need his help. That's what transformational uh, Christianity is all about. It's change from the inside out, not from the outside in. That's why the law can never work. Because the law was trying to change people from the outside. Grace changes people from the inside out. Big difference. Yes. All right.
Mm -hmm. That's very good. You like that? Yeah, I, yeah, you I can like do a whole too. message. I, 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 yeah. um, but it's true. I, it's not original with me. It's in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of good things to, to think of.